Well, our audience is from 11 to 21. That's our target audience. Well, we chose 11 to 21 for our target audience because we saw that the younger generation, you know, they weren't really getting to speak on things. It was more like adults and experts. So we just had this so they can understand what's going on since they are the younger generation and so they could speak up on it. Yes, our project company does have a name that we all agreed on, the marketing team and everything, well, everybody else. We we named it What's Happening in the Hood.com. We named, we said What's Happening in the Hood because the hood is our community, you know, far away. And dot .com is how we have to search our way to, you know, find out that we aren't the people that they stereotype us as. We can be anything that we want. Because I think that in this audience, we have leaders, we have people who want to tell their stories. So this is going to be called Healing Through Hip Hop, and I want to explain to you the vision. But before I do that, I want you to understand something. And I want you to think like this. I want you to change your mindset for just a minute. I don't want you to think of this as school. I want, you, I want you to think like you are producers of a film, because that's what we're going to do. That you're involved in a project that is going to be seen, not just here in Far Rockaway, but throughout the world. If we don't lead by example, by example, how we expect them to? We gotta be the change that we wanna see. We gotta stand up for our community. We gotta teach our kids. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. We in the building though, let's get it We standing together, the movement is loud You cannot stop us, you cannot turn us down We leading with love, the guns going down We leading with love, the guns going down About to make it little through the town Bring the foreigners out, bring the kids around And show them we spin in the city, we litty And nobody gotta get killed yeah. And I just make gang over there And yeah, they feel the same over there We stopping violence, putting love in the air We stopping violence, putting love in the the mission yeah. is clear, we riding together, we move for a purpose We saving these kids that be killing each other We get in these schools and we do it together Front line in the communities, tired of the silence of voices It's time that we raise up, it's time that we lace up Ain't nobody gonna save us but us Trust that, I'll be right here when you need me You can trust that, I'll be fighting till my knuckles bleeding Cause I love my country, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause I love my people Cause I love my people, cause Turn us down, we leading with love, the guns going down, we leading with love, the guns going down. About to make it little through the town, bring the foreigners out, bring the kids around. And show them we spin in the city, we litty, and nobody gotta get killed. Yeah. And I just make gang over there. And yeah, they feel the same over there. We stopping violence, putting love in the air. We stopping violence, putting love in the air. Hey, it's me, Benedict Oneji Kwe, and now we're here with my friend. And we're gonna be we're gonna be talking to him about we're gonna be talking to him about COVID nineteen how it affected him. Well, my name is Nathaniel Wilson. COVID nineteen affected me like I couldn't go to the deli anymore. I couldn't go to the park anymore. I couldn't do anything, Did and I could. Sad? Yes, I felt sad. I couldn't. I couldn't even hang out with my friends anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't even, I couldn't even go to my cousin's house. What was so special about your cousin? That, that's my dog. I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even go to their house anymore. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're becoming crushed under a tidal wave of unfathomable numbers. By one count, over a million have now been infected by coronavirus worldwide since the start of this outbreak. Tens of thousands have died. Tonight, in a stunning policy reversal, New York City joining California in urging the general public to wear non-medical face coverings to stop the virus. The crisis in New York reaching a critical mass. Paramedics now empowered to make life and death decisions that were once considered unthinkable.
And this is the deaths of COVID in NYC. It's 34% Hispanic, 28% Black, and 7% Asian. And in New York State, it's 14% Hispanic, 18% Black, 62% White, and 4% Asian. And that is of April 8th, 2022. Good afternoon, boys and girls. Good afternoon. I'm excited to be here because some of you look like me. And I was raised around students who look like you. I'm from Jamaica, Queens. I don't know if you guys know where Rochdale Village is in Jamaica, Queens. Does anyone know where Rochdale Village is in Jamaica, Queens? You do? Okay, that's where I was born and raised. So in Rochdale at the time, everyone looked out for everyone. The neighbors, everyone made sure that we got what we were supposed to get as, as children. And we used to play double dutch. The boys used to play basketball, baseball and other sports. And we did everything as a village. My mother was an educator. And so um, it was important for me to go to school, my siblings to go to school, that was important. But my life changed at the age of 12 because my mother got married, remarried, and I had a stepfather who was very, very abusive, right? And in those days, and some, some of you might know that there's things that we hold dear in our households because we don't wanna ask for help or speak to other people about what's going on due to maybe you're embarrassed, maybe you're ashamed. So what I ended up doing was I ended up leaving my house at 16 years old. And once I left at 16, I started hanging with my friends because I just didn't wanna go home. After that, it was, of course, very, very hard because you, have, you need stability. You need food. You need to take showers. You need to make sure that you're okay. And I'm still a young girl at that time. But people looked out for me. I always had the village looking out for me, making sure that I was okay. So then I ended up trying to go to college and I went back and forth, going to college, trying to write, and I ended up having my children at a young age, right? And again, it was a village. And as I'm raising my children, I have three children, they're adults now, but as I was raising my children, I said, I need to love myself enough so my children can be successful and love themselves. So I took advice from people, like the adults that you see here, to help me raise my children in a proper way. Then, after going to college, I started working for District 29 in Queens, right? I've been working for District 29 for 25 years. And then there was another village that helped me. I was very sad when my grandfather died. My grandfather was, um, a beautiful human being. He lived a long time, he was 94 years old. He's black Colombian. He stayed on his own for a long time and he even stayed in his apartment for a long time. And at that time we didn't know that COVID even existed. So when we found out that he needed medical attention, that's when we found out that he had COVID and he, they didn't give him the ventilator, meaning something to help him breathe because of his age. So for two weeks, he lived. His birthday was March 4th, and he died April 4th, a month after his birthday of COVID. What's your name, sir? <laughs> Jordan Graham. How did COVID-19 affect you? I felt like I wasn't gonna be able to. <laughs> Say that again, bro. I felt like I wasn't gonna be able to contact with um, more people. And um, I felt lonely because I was locked up in my house. Um, I ain't had nothing to do. I had
had nobody to go outside and play with. Did you have a female companion before you went to um <laughs> social distancing? A girlfriend? Yes. Uh yeah, but we were, I was we were going to do some things, you know. Uh, it felt like that I couldn't go back outside and the personality at all? Yeah. How you know? Um, basically how I felt was like mad and sad. It didn't affect me that bad because I didn't get it. And I was just chilling in the house, playing on my PlayStation, on my phone. But when it came to uh, like work and stuff, I just searched up the answers. I didn't feel like answering that. Yo, everyone, it's E Bands from What's Happening in the Hood.com. And I'm here with My Bands and J Bands. And I'm Kyle Royal. Okay, and has anyone ever told you you sound like Dwayne Johnson? <laughs> I sound like, you mean The Rock? Yes. No one has ever told me that uh, I sound like The Rock. But, um, yeah, so I've, I've heard some similarities to in our personality and how we act. So, no, nah, nobody ever told me that uh, I sounded like The Rock. Let me ask you guys something. By show, I, want, I want to call on someone. Why do you think that breakfast is important? You look very anxious. What is your name? Adalia Nunez. Okay. And she's gonna tell us why breakfast is important. Breakfast is important because that's the first meal of the day and it's, breakfast is very nutritious. That is an excellent answer. Give her a round of applause. Now, I'm going to expand on that answer just a little bit regarding nutrition. We all know that cars are made of metal, right? Obviously. Buildings are made of bricks. And people are made up of food. And the food that you eat consists of, take a guess. We can yell it out if we know the answer. Let's hear it. Nutrition, nutrition, that's right. What made you want to become a bodybuilder? Oh, that's a good question. What made me want to become a bodybuilder? Well, <laughs> when I was a little kid, I was uh, infatuated with and obsessed with uh, muscles and wrestling. And I remember it like yesterday, I was watching WWF, what you know as the WWE. And Vince McMahon had a special on bodybuilders. And they came out flexing because he had started his own company. and. I was uh, younger than you guys, and I was watching, and my jaw dropped because I was in awe of all the muscles and uh, the way that they would lift weights and work out. I never thought in a million years that I could look like that. I had played sports my entire life, and when I left the uh, military and left college, I was in the gym, and I said to one of the bodybuilders in the gym, I want to do a show. And he said, okay. Three months, there's a show. And I said, no, 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 I was scared. And I got ready for the show, and that's the first time that I had six-pack abs and muscles. So uh, I got hooked after that, and um, I was really dedicated towards bodybuilding, and I was like three times the size. How did COVID affect your mental and physical health? I'll start with my physical health. Uh, as far as my physical health, I couldn't no longer get to the gym because all the gyms were closed around the city. So I had to uh, get equipment from other places and uh, do certain workouts in the house that really were in a full gym workout. So I lost some muscle, I lost some weight, and uh, you know, I uh, got creative in the home. Uh, lifting weights to sort of maintain that. Mental health, I was fine, I never stopped working. So I always went to work through the pandemic. My question is, how did it make you feel when you first found out you couldn't work outside, like in a gym? Oh, I wasn't very happy at all. <laughs> wasn't very happy at all. A lot of people in my field of bodybuilding and fitness, um, we were sneaking around certain gyms that we weren't supposed to. Uh, we were looking to get equipment from areas uh, 
that uh, we normally wouldn't. I kind of like got frustrated with myself because I had sold a bunch of my equipment earlier on. And I tried to call the people back that I sold it to to get back my weights. So I wasn't very happy. Okay, here we go. Hi, yo, everyone. This is E Money. What's happening in the hood.com? And I'm here with my assistant, Homer Simpsons. And today we're going to be going into the music department and asking them some questions about what they do. And we're here with Mr. Kurt Kelly. And we're going to be interviewing him today. To basically educate our scholars and to help them to heal through music, through, through song, basically. When COVID-19 happened, what were the effects and damages that it caused? Us? It caused a lot of um, damages to me and to the world at large. Um, basically, COVID caused us to have to um, revamp, rethink, relive. Um, not really fear for my life, but we had to do everything differently. We had to be teaching from a screen versus being in a, the classroom and just change our entire life. You know, for two years, you have been home. Um, you know, staying home, not able to go and do our regular duties and so on and so forth. So I heard you had a little sound tape going on. Can we hear, just get a little sneak peek of that? Oh. Something like that. Um, so it's a song that the entire um, scholar cohort had came up with. Uh, basically, the theme is COVID, what they actually have been through COVID. And so we created a song surrounding um, COVID itself. The title of our song is Combat COVID. And um, just to give you a little sneak peek of the chorus itself. So one, two, one, two, three, four. Leave the virus, black COVID. Leave the virus, black COVID. Leave the virus. Hey guys, it's Homer Simpson, and today we're going to be with the drama department, but I'm here with my trusty partner, J-Band Cap. Um, so, we're just going to be showing what they be doing around these places. Hi, Mr. Rivera. So, what are you doing to mark um, the drama department? So, each grade will be picking their own scene or experience that they had during COVID, and they will be acting out a scene for that. Not a scene, okay. Um, so how do you feel about the drama department? I feel every grade is picking their view and they're doing a great job at it. Okay. I might do something greater. Does any student here want to come up and tell us what you learned? Okay, what I learned is that, like, um, that we get to do, like, acting, do our own little thing, rapping, singing, and, yeah. That's what I learned. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about doing the rapping, singing, and those stuff like that, and the acting? Um, I feel happy, and I'm having fun with it. Okay, so we're going to hear from Mr. Smith. This is a, a, a faculty member here who's going to share what his experience was. Hi, my name is Mr. Smith. I am the administrative assistant here at Challenge. Um, just like Jordan, I did feel the same way. Um, not being able to see my family, even though I didn't stay inside when I was supposed to stay inside. Um, luckily, I was able to get to see my mom for the little bit of time that we were supposed to be on the inside. Um, but it, it was sad. I couldn't play basketball as much as I wanted to. Um, everything was closed down. All the good food places was closed down. Um, so it was, pretty, it was a pretty sad moment for me as well. Hi, my name is Makai. And some of the things I did was I slept and I made food. 
It was very interesting because I didn't know how to cook. Hi, this is Dr. Shungo Blake from What's Happening in the Hood.com. We are here at Challenge Charter Preparatory School, and I'm sitting here with a very important person, and that is our brother Ian, who is the head custodial engineer here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Well, listen, I just wanted to, um, first of all, thank you for sitting down and talking with us. So, brother Ian, um, you played a critical role during COVID. You know, when COVID happened, you know, a lot of times they talked about how the schools had to be cleaned in a different way, um, you know, especially when children were coming back to school. Um, could you tell us, like, what were some of the things that you noticed different, like, in terms of how you kept a school clean and, and then the shift of how you went through your process now with students returning? You know, you know, during COVID, during the midst of COVID. Yes. Um, first, uh, you know, we have to uh, make sure school is properly sanitized, and all the desks and the floors, the walls, everything is clean and sanitized and get ready for the kids to come into school, because we didn't know what was going on with this COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. So, my team and I, you know, we. Make sure all the walls are properly painted and uh, the floor is properly clean. You know, so and we sanitized everything and we sprayed the whole place. You know, so to kill all the germs and bacteria. So do you smile when you see all the students returning back and you know the life back in the school? I mean, it was a time where the schools were closed, everybody was online. How did it feel to see everybody return and know that your work helped make that possible? Yeah, it feels good, you know, it feels good to see everybody come back and, you know, they're happy and not scared and, and, and just move about their day and don't really have to worry, you know, because we're there to make sure everything is clean and they're safe. Absolutely. It's something that city officials and NYPD officers have been trying to crack down on since the beginning of the year when there seemed to be a rise in these gun violence shootings. It continues to plague the city. Uh, the latest incident, I should say the fatal incident happening about a block from where I'm standing right now it was a very active crime scene in the earlier hours of the morning as police continue their investigation, not only into this shooting, but all of the shootings around the five boroughs, all separate incidents. And in many cases, the victims, innocent bystanders who are the wrong place at the wrong time. There is a new major problem in America and its name is gun violence. In 2022, gun violence has increased majorly <clears throat> and has shown no sign of stopping. According to a Washington Post, it states they have been already there have already been more than 300 mass shootings in the United States. My name is Luis Lopez. My story is I was shot at the age of 14 years old by my best friend's older brother in East New York, Brooklyn. I've been in this chair for 30 years. As a kid, I had it hard. My family was poor. I, it was just my mom's. There was times we went to sleep hungry. It was, it was four of us, my two younger brothers and an older sister. And you know, it was very hard times. School was hard, I was getting cheese. Because I had name brand sneakers, the name brand clothes. Um, I had a disability because everybody in my family was illiterate. They didn't finish school, they didn't know how to read and write. So when I went home, nobody was able to teach me. So, you know, when I got shot, my pain and suffering started way before I got shot. My name is Jeff Williams. I'm also part of the God Gives Blessing organization. Um, my book is called My Feet Are Off the Ground. I named this book My Feet Are Off the Ground because there's so many things that I have accomplished without using my feet on the ground. Um, and my story started also by not listening. My mother told me to come home the last day of school. I was 13 years old. And instead of coming home, I went to my friend's house. When I got to my friend's house, he came out the room and he had a gun. He started playing with me and my brother with the gun. He pointed the gun at me, and my brother told him, stop playing with the gun, stop pointing the gun at him. But he was fooling around and playing. Next thing I know, I saw a ball of fire. I heard a loud noise, and I saw a ball of fire. So I grabbed my head, and the bullet hit me under my arm. And because he was standing a couple of feet from me, the bullet went down on an angle and touched the nerve on my spine. So it left me paralyzed from the waist down. At that moment, because the bullet was so hot, it closed the skin and melted my arm back shut. 
and all the blood couldn't come out my body, so I was bleeding internally. Both of my lungs filled up with blood. I ended up making it to the hospital. I caught a cab to the hospital. And when I got there, I was in the emergency room, and I'm laying there, and I ended up being in the hospital for the next six months, just looking, staring at the ceiling. I couldn't move. I was in a coma state. They was, I was fighting for my life. And as Lewis was saying, in, in those moments, you start looking back, saying to yourself, why didn't I just listen? Why didn't I just go home? And I say that to, to all of your kids here today, when your teacher's telling you something that's for your best interest, when your mother and your parents are talking to you and you don't want to hear it, those mistakes can end up deadly. Those mistakes can end up into these situations that I was left in where now I can't walk anymore. There's been a lot of gun violence recently going on since seems like COVID has hit, the gun violence is going up. There's shootings all around the country. Every day you turn on the daily news, another young person's been shot. We know about the shootings in Buffalo. We know about the shootings in Texas. And I'm curious to know what kind of impact did these shootings have on children? When you see an 11, 12, seven year old die from gun violence, what kind of impact does that have on you? So I'm here with Oliver. Oliver. And Oliver, what grade are you in? I'm going to eight. How, how old are you? Fifteen. So you're 15 years old. So how do you feel when you see and hear about all this gun violence happening in communities like Far Rockaway? Uh, I feel that it's bad that this is happening because uh, a lot of us young people don't get to live out uh, their full life. So you had mentioned before about the, the, the laws. Do you think that the gun laws are strict enough in New York City? Uh, as of right now, no, because they uh, changed the law actually a couple of days back that you, uh, it's legal to carry a gun in New York City. And I think that's why most of the shootouts are happening now because it's easier to get a weapon. Yeah, uh, I'm sometimes fearful of these things because like you never know when someone might just snap and like try to shoot up a place and like sometimes it happens like in other places too like not not just like in this country like uh there are like some kidnappings in haiti and like mm. my sister's is in haiti so sometimes i'm like scared of something like that happens so, so you worry about like what's happening over there with her yeah are you fearful when your family members go outside do you ever worry about them becoming victims of gun violence or fearful for yourself. Yeah, cause you know, there's some crazy people, crackheads and stuff out there selling stuff that's fake and trying to rob people they, for their money. So you gotta watch your back every time. Cause you know, somebody gonna go park their car. So if you leave the car on and unlock the door, somebody could go steal the car and it's for them. So when I feel like my parents is going out, some of the times I want to come with them mm. cause I don't really feel safe because somebody could kidnap my parents, kill my parents and stuff like that. And uh, for me, I'm always looking back, left from right, just to check on my surroundings because I don't feel safe when I'm walking by myself. Uh, I think you should just stay out of trouble and uh, don't join gangs because it's not good for you and it's not good for your reputation either. I started running in the streets, not listening to my family, my mother, not listening to the teachers. I listened to adults telling me to stop doing the things I'm doing. I started selling crack cocaine at the age of 11 years old. Um, I was taken in by a family that sold drugs and not having a father figure in life. I, I, I thought they was my, you know, I thought that was the, the, you know, the thing to do. And at the age of 14, I, was, I knew how to play with guns. I knew how to sell crack. I knew how to, I knew how to do all these things, but I didn't know how to read and write. And then I was shot by my best friend's older brother. I was also shot by the same gun I thought I was protecting myself with, that I used to hold, had, thought I was gonna protect myself with. I got shot with the same gun by my best friend's older brother. And he was a grown man, I was 14, he was 27 years old. To this day, I don't, to this day, I don't know why it's the real reason he put that gun up to my face and shot me. The bullet went through my hand, hit me in my face, and left me like this, I can't do nothing myself. I wake up like this every day. Um, life is hard, but like um, time doesn't stop for nobody. 
Life doesn't stop anybody. My brain still works. One thing I tell y'all kids, the, most, the strongest weapon in the world is y'all brain. One, as long as our brain is working, we can do anything in this world. I ain't know how to write a book. I'm an author now. I wrote a book, The Bird That Saved My Life. I'm working on part two, The Bird That Saved My Life Global. Um, I, run, I didn't know how to run a business or organization, but I'm doing it. I'm saying that to tell y'all there's nothing impossible in life to do. Whatever you put your mind to and you stay positive, you can do it. There's nothing in the streets. Y'all in the right place, y'all in school. Education is the only way to get out these streets. Y'all wanna get your parents out, y'all wanna buy a house, y'all wanna, I use my brother, one of my youngest brothers as an example. Because he went to school, he went to college, now he got a house in North Carolina, he drives a Mercedes Benz, and can't nobody ever take that from him because he earned it, he went to school, and he, he earned that, he worked hard for that. When you run these streets and you make these, this money, it, it doesn't last, man. I think it's a long time and I lived my life with no excuses. So I went on to college. I graduated from John Jay College. I got a job at Copley. Thank you. I graduated from Adelphi University. I got a job at Colgate Palmolive. I've been there 25 years. I'm a motivational speaker. I'm also a real estate broker. I did multi-million dollar deals in the Bronx and Manhattan. I'm, in, I'm actually posted on the New York Real Estate Institute School um, alumni in the news if you want to look it up. I, I've been featured on CNN, New York Times stories, um, and there's so many things that I have accomplished even after the fact that I was in a wheelchair. I have a son that's 23 years old. I uh, also fly airplanes. For those of you who think people with wheelchairs can't do anything, I fly airplanes, I ride slingshot motorcycles, and I drive boats and all these different things, but my biggest accomplishment is not how much money I've made, how much cars I have, but success to me is how many lives I've changed. So that's why I'm here today to change your lives. Thank you. I'm going to let you have the last word. What is your message, your message to the mayor of New York City? If Mayor Eric Adams is watching this right now, He's a person who has a lot of control, a lot of power, a lot of influence. What would you tell Mayor Eric Adams? What do you want him to know about what's happening with gun violence in Far Rockaway? Um, what I would say to Mayor, Mayor Eric Adams is stop the gun violence. And like what Oliver said, um, to make the um, the laws more strict. Because I, I don't agree on people... It's okay for people to be walking around with guns on the street because anytime somebody could have gone through anything and stuff like that and just shoot somebody or something like that. So I think you should make the laws more stricter and probably the age for guns and the gun laws should go up like higher than what it is because it's going to be easier for anybody who's the young, the young adults to come up and do all these stuff. So I think they should make the age restriction higher up and um, for to get all these people who are out in the streets doing gang stuff to get them all together and to, for them to stop doing that because I don't think it's good to um, be in a gang and do all these type of crazy stuff. Thank you. This is Dr. Blake from What's Happening in the Hood dot com. Hello, this is Benedict and this is What's Happening in the Hood dot com and this is my accomplice. J Bands. Um, so, so we're gonna be showing you what's happening in behind the scenes of what we're doing here. And this is what's happening on the marketing department. So what do you guys do in the marketing department? So here in the marketing department, we're working on a variety of things. It's the research department and the marketing department. And what we're doing is we're gathering information about various zip codes. We're looking at words that may help us understand clearly what we're doing and now we're working on we're researching some statistics on different topics such as the hospital and the cdc on um, the COVID 19 results we're talking about george floyd we're talking about gun violence we're talking about black lives matter and we're talking about school shootings and not only are we talking about it one of our students 
here at Challenge was um, killed due to gun violence. And so we're trying to also pose information about him and put him to, into this film as well. Okay, so I'm Imani from What's Happening in the Hood.com, and I'm here with Gil Rios. And I'm also here with Dr. Shango Blake. Okay, and I, we, we're going to interview y'all today. So what made y'all come up with this project? So um, I was called by Dr. Blake to be a part of this project. And once I heard of the idea, I fell in love with it and I didn't hesitate. I said, absolutely. If I get to teach my people film while they do a short film in the process, that'll be a blessing for me. So that's why I decided to do it. So um, I did a project like this over 20 years ago. I saw the power of exposing young people to producing their own projects, producing their own film, using their own voice. Um, and I saw how successful it was. And I wanted to bring that experience to this school um, because anytime I get an opportunity to give an, op to, 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 to give an opportunity for young people to express themselves and talk about their world, I'm excited about it and I'm, and I'm all in. What's your name? Kyle. What grade are you in? Seven, I'm six. Okay, why do you want to do this program? Because I thought it might be good to help in a program, and I, and I never thought it would be bad because I used to be an actor, and it was fun. So I wanted to see how it was like to be on the camera, and I'm the cameraman. What have you learned from this program? I learned how to be a good cameraman and how it's like on set when you're making a film. And it's really fun to me. And I'm here with? Jordan. How old are you? 12. What class are you in? 701. And why did you join this program? Uh, because I like videoing or recording things and um, uploading them on YouTube and stuff like that. So Do you I chose that. I would like to join here and help. Do you think that this could w help you later in life? Yeah, I possibly could because probably right now because I interview people for my own channel. And I'm here with? Janaya. How old are you? 11. What class are you in? 602. And why do you want to do this program? Honestly, I didn't even know I signed up to it. My mom did it for me, so. Do you enjoy doing the program? Yeah, it's really fun. What have you learned? I've learned how different angles work and how a, a film style works. How do you think it could work um, when you get later in life? If I ever want to apply to direct a film or film a, or film something, I film the background on like what we do before we start filming and stuff. On Monday, May 25th, Minneapolis police officers respond to a call about a customer using a counterfeit $20 bill. Officers arrive and pull the suspect, 46-year-old George Floyd, from his car, placing him in handcuffs. Minutes later, officers lay Floyd down beside the rear tire of a police car. An officer later identified as Derek Chauvin places his knee on Floyd's neck. As Floyd tells officers he can't breathe, bystanders plead for his life. Bro, he's stopping his breathing right there, bro. Yeah, can't breathe. After approximately three minutes, Floyd becomes unresponsive. Officer Chauvin continues to keep his knee on Floyd's neck until paramedics arrive, approximately five minutes later. The incident is the latest in a series of racially charged confrontations in recent weeks, including the death of Ahmaud Arbery, the police shooting of Breonna Taylor. The other part uh, that's, that, that's really happening is it's like you got two things happening at the same time, right? We have the gun violence, but we also have like the police in the way they treat us in our communities. How do you feel about that? About the police, I don't think it's fair. We should all be treated the same way. People out here getting shot and stuff. Like you got little kids at my age that's like 13 and under, like working, working, getting kidnapped, getting shot at, like drive-by happens. Well, they need to put the guns down. It made me sad and stuff, cause you know, the black people didn't deserve that. It affected me because, you know. Did you feel for George, for George Floyd? Yes. You felt for 
but I was getting scared of the movement. They was burning down stores and stuff. How did you? How did you feel? But I, but I got mad because, um, this is not what Martin Luther King wanted. They using violence. Yeah. You're right. He worked hard for all that success, but then people, people like us, they wanted to like take that success and ruin it and burn it to the ground. Hundreds of people gathered in Minneapolis on Tuesday night to decry the death of Floyd. Police officers in riot gear fire rubber bullets at the crowd. By Wednesday, as protests spread nationwide, George Floyd's sister, Bridget Floyd, calls for justice. I would like for those officers to be charged with murder. By Thursday, new video reveals that three officers were on top of Floyd during the arrest. Governor Tim Waltz activates the National Guard. On the third night of protests, crowds gather outside the third police precinct in downtown Minneapolis. So, you know, when we were at home, all of a sudden we started hearing about George Floyd, right? We started hearing about Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor. These were people that were, they were, they died at the hands of either watch groups or the police. And then people started hitting the streets and protesting. When you saw that happening on the TV, did you know what was going on? At first, I did not know what's going on. But my mom broke it down to me and told me that we are getting killed and we are, get, we are getting put in jail for no reason. How did that make you feel once you understood from your mother what was happening? How did you feel about that? I felt confused on why it was happening and shocked to believe that the police was doing this to us. Were you afraid when you saw what happened to George Floyd? Yeah, a little bit. How? How? Basically, when um, when the news spread it about George Floyd and how he was um, slain by a cop, the news spread quite like it, it spread it everywhere. And basically, seeing George Floyd get put down for for his skin color was not a good sight to see. When you saw the news story about George Floyd, how did you feel? I felt like shocked because I didn't know that was gonna happen. Um, I felt sad because um, he didn't do anything and they just, you know, killed him. Now, when George Floyd, the news story happened, you know, there was a lot of protests going on. Did you go to any of those protests? No. Yes. You did? How was your experience at the protests? It was fun because I get to hold a poster and I get to fight for all dark skins. How did you feel when the George Floyd incident happened? Um, I felt sad because the police are killing African Americans for no reason. Um, I felt angry because it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't fair to what happened to George Floyd. The 170 businesses have been damaged by vandalism, looting, or fires. Minneapolis police arrest ex-officer Derek Chauvin and charge him with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Charging papers state that Chauvin had his knee on Floyd's neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. Friday night, demonstrations continue across the country. Hundreds are arrested, police cars are burned, and scuffles break out between law enforcement and protesters in New York, Atlanta, Los Angeles, and more. The governors of several states announced they will deploy the National Guard to restore order. What's good, everybody? It's Jaden from What's Happening in the Hood.com, and I'm here with... Rose Guerriere. So, we have a few questions for you today. Um, what, did, what do you do? Like, where do you work? Um, I do international public relations. I'm also an event producer. I own a company. I do, uh, I'm an entrepreneur as well and an advocate. So what does public relations mean? Public relations means spreading the message out. It means culminating relationships, building relationships, and synergizing relationships. Hi, my name is Grace. My company that I work that I'm working with will be what's happening in the hood.com and I will be talking about our marketing plan. So first we have our money budget. We need a money budget because we think that we will need some stuff to work with during this project and that 
some of the things will cost a bit of money to do. We might need some more land or we could just use the school, for example. All right. So first off, do you have any recommendations on social media apps and how to spread the word that what's happening in the about what's happening in the hood.com project? Well, first of all, tell me a little bit about what's happening in the hood.com. All right. So what's happening in hood.com is basically this big project that we're working on. And it's about what we've been through these last few years, two years during COVID, gun violence, school shootings, and many of those things are still happening. So we're going, that's what the project is going to be based on. Okay. And you want to be able to put that information out there in social media so that the community will know about your project? Yes. Okay. So that's public relations. That's part of one of the aspects of public relations, getting your message out there. And there are many different tools in which you can do that. You can do it through the media, print, television, radio, and social media, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very wide and a great way for you to get your brand and your messaging out there. How did you start your company? Ooh, that's... Ooh, that's a great question. How did I start the company? Uh, my company started about 21, 22 years ago um, when I was working in events. I first started uh, as an event planner and I built a lot of relationships with many clients. And um, some of those relationships, a lot of people asked me to represent their businesses, represent them as a client in many different ways. And I built a great list of, of individuals, organizations, people. I met many different people from uh, United Nations, many people from uh, different countries. And, uh, you know, I started building a great list of, of a great database. And with that database, I'm able to build relationships and uh, communicate uh, different messages for people. Um, I'm an advocate of the community, so I've done a lot of things in the community that help to build bridges. How are we going to showcase this film? How are you going to showcase this film? Yes. Wonderful question. You can do a launch. You can do a film screening. Almost like when the movies are coming out, right? What do they do? They put out a trailer to let everyone know, hey, this is coming out. The date is coming out. And a little clip of what you're going to be seeing. And you do a film screening. So now you get everyone to come out, give them some popcorn if you want, something interactive. Give them some popcorn, make it like a whole, like, like a film. You understand? Like, like a, uh, I'm sorry, a film screening. And you get everybody to come out. You can even get a theater if you want to. Get a small theater, bring some people out, and launch your film. Uh, most of the time, I would basically watch TV during class. And then when it came on to work, I would do it. <laughs> All right. So COVID-19 didn't really affect me. Because um, at first, I got a little bit, I was a little bit down, I didn't see my friends. But I thought about it. I didn't have to see their faces. I didn't have to, I didn't have to conversate with them. All I, did, all I had to really do was wear my uniform shirt. And I, and I could just be inside of a blanket all I wanted. And also, I could just turn, I could turn off the camera. Are we in this mirror right here? We still I see that sleeping when I did. I'm in, I'm, I put blankets all over me. Yeah, I, just, I was just sitting and, there like this. Um, when, they get, when they used to give me breaks, I used to just stay in there and watch TV. Part of the TV when they when they took it off, so it was actually good for me. I got to watch TV and learn at the same time. What's up, everybody? It's Jaden from What's Happening in the Hood dot com, and I'm here with Dr. Shango Blake. We're gonna ask him about this project and a little bit about him. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm born in uh, Jamaica, Queens. Uh, grew up out here uh, all my life. Uh, went to school in the schools in Queens and, and I was inspired to become a principal of a school um, in Queens Village. And so I've done my whole career working 
as an educator, inspiring young people, putting on innovative programs, transforming schools. I um, mean, I bring to this my experience and my love for hip hop music. And I found the way to integrate both my love of hip hop and my love of education together uh, in a way that has made real impact. Combining your love of education and hip hop. Um, so I, I was, I, when I, be, when I, became principal of a school. It was it was a school that was really a school that was tough. And the young people in there were not connected with the adults. And it was a lot of chaos, fights, gangs, things of that nature. And so what I, what I realized is that hip hop had a profound impact on my life when I was young. And I noticed that the young people at the time that I was principal were also into hip hop. And so I said, what, how could I find a way to get a message to them in a way that they would actually listen to it. And I realized the power of hip hop music. And so that inspired me to say, let's like find a way to um, deliver a message of academic excellence using hip hop music. Cause at the time it was all about gangster music, but I noticed that they were using like hip hop to sell Pepsi and Sprite and all these other things. I said, well, if you could use hip hop to sell all these products, why can't we use hip hop to market academic excellence? My, my question is, why do you feel that you need to save the kids? Because I'm trying to save myself. That if I'm looking into the future and, and I think about, it's very a very selfish reason that if you are not prepared to lead, then when I am not able to take care of myself, who's going to take care of me? So it's in the best interest of every adult to invest in young people because one day you're going to lead us. And if you don't have the knowledge, understanding and expertise to lead us, then I'm leaving this country and I'm leaving myself in a very scary position. And I'm also really vested in the future. One other aspect of why this is so important to me is that in my family's origin story, my father was a young person who was neglected. And um, so this for me is not just a, a project. I'm passionate about it because my father grew up in foster care. Um, he, was, he's, he, he saw his uh, mother try to commit suicide at the, when he was only nine years old. And so he was a very unprotected child. And he told me the stories of everything that he went through as a young man. And by him pouring into me, it made me to be the kind of person wanted to create the type of programs um, that would help young people, especially the young people who are in the most difficult, challenging situations, because it remind me of my father and his story. A number of feelings. I feel excited. I feel joy. I'm enjoying being here. This is where I want to be. Sometimes I feel frustrated. And sometimes I feel annoyed because I want this project to come out well, I want you to be able to see how important and how strong and how valuable you truly are. So, you know, those are the different emotions that I go through at times only because I care and I really love our young people. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else this summer but here working on this project because I think it's that critically important. My name is Randy. I don't got to say that. Uh, <laughs> Randy, uh, that's private, and yes it is. Yo, everyone, it's Eve Bans from What's Happening in Hood.com, and I'm here with our CEO of Challenge Charter Schools, Dr. Mullins. Dr. Mullins, can you introduce yourself? And say oh, you thank you, Elise. I'm delighted to be here this evening to uh, just uh, have a conversation with you guys. I know you guys are doing great work. Um, it's my pleasure and honor. No problem. Okay, so first question. What inspired you to make Challenge? The inspiration uh, for Challenge Starter Schools really come out of a great need for the community. I've worked in uh, this community, District 27, for the DOE for over 15 years. And I've served in several capacity all the way from guidance counselor all the way down to City Hall. The need, uh, in my mind, uh, was always uh, the reason for uh, my, my effort 
to uh, establish Challenge Charter School. Um, I lived in Far Rockaway for a while as a young man. I lived in Far Rockaway, but I got married, and uh, you know, I I'm now responsible for a family. And my biggest concern, working with the school system in Far Rockaway, I used to work. I've worked in almost every every uh, school site in Far Rockaway from elementary all the way up to high school. All the high school campuses. At one point in time, I had all the high school campuses. Um, and my biggest concern was knowing and seeing up front and firsthand what the uh, educational system is. My biggest concern was if I live in this community, then I'd have to send my children to this community. So um, it prompted me to uh, establish what we call quality education, because I, did, uh, I do believe uh, from then and even now that um, every child should have the right to a quality education. And so um, I eventually moved out of Far Rockaway into the five towns. And my kids went to uh, high school, Lawrence High School, and they did very well. They excelled in everything. But the need was still there. And, um, you know, I couldn't walk away without doing something about what education should be like in this Far Rockaway community. So we, uh, I brought a group of community leaders together, elected officials, community leaders, um, church members from all over the place. Uh, and um, we put this whole initiative together to establish a charter school and the rest is history. So what are some responsibilities that you have as being the CEO of this big school? Well, as the CEO of the school, I have all the responsibilities <laughs> to ensure that every student is getting a quality education. To, to ensure that teaching and learning is happening every single day, to ensure that teachers are teaching and students are learning, to ensure that um, uh, students are developed and the students are moving from one place, from one step to the other, from one place to the other. To all the kids that are listening right now, what do you want them to take away from this interview? Okay, the big takeaway here is that um, we start, I started out with nothing and here I am today the CEO of a large school establishment. If I can make an impact in my community, you can make an impact in your community. If I can do what I do, you can do what I do and even better. We stopping violence, putting love in the air. We stopping violence, putting love in the. The mission is clear. We riding together. We move for a purpose. We saving these kids that be killing each other. We get in these schools and we do it together. Front line in the communities. Tired of the silence of voices. It's time that we raise up. It's time that we lace up. Ain't nobody gonna save us but us. Trust that I'll be right here when you need me. You can trust that I'll be fighting till my knuckles bleeding. Cause I love my, cause I love my people and I need them. Cause I love my, cause I. I love my people when I need them, cause we We standing together, the movement is loud You cannot stop us, you cannot turn us down We leading with love, the guns going down We leading with love, the guns going down About to make it little through the town Bring the farms out, bring the kids around And show them we spinning the city, we litty And nobody gotta get killed it's yeah. it's it's And I just make gang over there And get yeah, it feel the same over there We stopping violence, putting love in the air